Welcome to you all uh, to the Peristyle once again for a master's series. And I'm particularly pleased to welcome Mr. Deke Wells and the board of Toledo Museum of Art, who's been meeting today, uh, to welcome Julia Bars, who's our TMA board member and president of the TMA Ambassadors, um, who uh, sponsored this master's series, which has been so successful over recent years. And um, all here present, um, in June this year, we finished a five-year program which has had some changes to the museum. Whether it's just opening the door to the peristyle so that people come in and see it, or having thousands of people on Monroe Street opening playtime, we are making every effort with this museum, which is such a storied history, to make it more available to more people all the time. And the board agreed in June that over the next five years, in addition to all the other stated things that we are doing, we would seek to demonstrate diversity, equity, and inclusion. And this is a challenge to us. It'll be difficult work and challenging work, but one that we're determined to make successful. And we have an incredible team here, and we will need support from a lot of people to reach parts of the community that don't know that we're free, and don't know that we're available, and don't know that this is for them. And we need to reflect all parts of the community in what people see in this museum when they look at what's on the walls and on the floors, as well as all the people who visit it. And so last January, I was on a coach at an art museum director's meeting in Mexico City, sitting with Don Dr. Janetta Vetch Cole, and we knew that she was going to be the president of our American Association of Art Museum Directors on July 1 of this year. And talking about this challenge that museums face, art museums tend not to be as reflective of the demographics of our population um, as they should be. And we have work to do. And Dr. Cole agreed on that coach that she would come to Toledo to help us with our work. And she's a very remarkable person whom I'm delighted um, to uh, feel is such a strong friend and support as she's been to so many people in her, in her life. She was appointed as director of the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art in Washington, D.C. in March uh, 2009. Um, she actually came out of retirement to do that. Um, it was founded uh, as a small museum in 1964 on Capitol Hill um, 50 years ago, and then became part of the Smithsonian Institution, which now has 19 museums, uh, in 1979. And in 1987, it moved to its current very beautiful building and position on the National Mall. It represents the art of nearly every area of the continent of Africa in so many different variety of media and art forms. But before being a museum director, she's been a teacher all her life and uh, an educator. She's a very distinguished educator and humanitarian. Um, as a, in a career as a college president, a university professor through all her published work, her many speeches, community service, consultations with corporations and not-for-profit organizations, She's consistently, and like a beacon in our community, addressed issues of race and gender and all forms of inequality. She served as president of Spelman College and Bennett College for Women, America's two historically black colleges for women. The only person to have served in those two roles. She's also a distinguished professor emerita of Emory University uh, from which she retired as Presidential Distinguished Professor of Anthropology, Women's Studies, and African-American Studies. In the case of Dr. Cole, it really is worth telling you a, more about her life, because at the age of 15, uh, she entered an early entrance exam at Fisk University in Nashville and took a, what was supposed to be a, um, a short-term uh, undergraduate study period in Oberlin College, but stayed there and earned uh, later a master's degree and PhD in anthropology from Northwestern University with a focus on African studies. She made history in 1987 when she became the first African-American woman to serve as president of Spelman College. And during her presidency, Spelman was named the number one liberal arts college of the South. And during her presidency at Bennett College, she opened a, an art gallery and initiated programs in women's studies and global studies. She has been a global traveler. She has done study um, and research in Africa, in the Caribbean, 
and in the United States. And she's the author of and editor of several books, uh, scores of scholarly articles, fellow of the American Anthropology Anthropological Association and of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And as I said, she currently serves as president of the American Association of Art Museum Directors in its centenary year. Jeanetta Cole has been awarded 68 honorary degrees. She's the recipient of many, many awards, just to name a few, the Alex Alexis de Tocqueville Award for Community Service from the United Way of America, the Joseph Prize for Human Rights uh, presented by the Anti-Defamation League, the George Washington Carver Award, the Benjamin Franklin Creativity Laureate Award, the Alston Jones International Civil and Human Rights Award. From 2004 to 2006, uh, Dr. Cole was the chair of the board of United Way of America, the first African American to serve in that position. She is a just a career of firsts. She served on the corporate boards of Home Depot, Merck, Nations Bank South, and was the first woman to serve on the board of Coca-Cola Enterprises. She currently chairs the board of the National Visionary Leadership Project. She's a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, anybody here? <laughs> Incorporated, <laughs> and of the Lynx uh, Incorporated and the National Council of Negro Women. Um, she's married to uh, James D. Staten Jr. And uh, she's mother of three sons and a stepson. She has three grandchildren. She's been a mentor to so many women and men. She is a lady of heroes and sheroes, as I've learned from her. Last week uh, at a seminar in Washington, D.C., uh, to which I was invited by Dr. Cole, I did hear her summed up when she was described wonderfully as a seed planter, a soil cultivator and a harvest celebrant. Can I invite you to give the warmest of Toledo welcomes to Dr. Cole. Again, by thanking my colleague, my friend, my brother, Brian P. Kennedy. <laughs> I really am grateful that Brian invited me to serve as a speaker in your master series. Now, he said in this letter inviting me to come, to do this, that the topic that I would discuss would be of my choosing. But now watch this. <laughs> the very next sentence on the letter said this, quote, the Toledo Museum of Art is adopting on July 1 a new strategic plan, the second five-year plan in our 2020 vision. We have added a stated basic principle, implicit in the previous plan, but now explicit that we are making it a strategic objective to have diversity, equity, and inclusion be part of all of our activities. Very cleverly done, Brother Brian. <laughs> I should choose to talk about anything I wanted to talk about, however, the truth of the matter is I share with Brian a deep commitment to the struggle for far greater diversity, equity, and inclusion in our American art museums. So here I am, dear friends, sisters and brothers all, ready to address this question. It's not the first time, it will not be the last time. And so I thought I would begin by telling you a story, a story that justifies why some things are worth saying again and again and again. It's the story of an old lady 
who was clearly about to transition from this life into the next. She was about to physically leave a small, very poor village in which she lived. And the villagers, the very few material things, nevertheless had enormous hearts. And sensing that the old lady was about to go off to glory, they decided to pool their meager resources and buy for her something she had always wanted, a guitar. <laughs> and so one evening with great celebration, pomp, circumstance, they presented the guitar to the old lady. She took it in her arms as if it were a newborn baby, and she stroked it, and she kissed it, and then she played a note. And of course, the villagers clap, 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 clap. She played the note again, and again, and again. The head of the village said, not to worry, she's just, you know, in love with the guitar. She'll, she'll find some other notes, and off they went off to bed. But I'm here to testify that all night long, the old lady played the same note. And because it was a small village, and people lived very closely together, the villagers listened to the same note all night long. The next morning, few having slept well, they came together with the head of the village, who spoke as carefully and respectfully and diplomatically as he could. He said, old lady, we're so happy that you love your guitar, but you know, we're not so poor that we don't have one radio and one TV, and surely you have watched and heard that when someone has a guitar, they go up and down the neck, and they play different notes. The old lady looked at all of the villagers, and she said, oh yes, I've heard that, I've seen it. But let me explain, those folk who are doing that, they're looking for the note, I found it. <laughs> well, please know that it is not out of arrogance or an attitude of I know it all that I'm here to address one more time the issue of diversity, equity, and inclusion. It is out of a sincere and passionate conviction that this issue is one of the most important issues of our times. It is an issue of extreme importance in this museum, in my museum, in all museums, in all of the communities throughout our country, in every sector in our nation, and indeed throughout our world. To make this point again, let us watch a video, a video that captures a truly important conversation between two icons, Darren Walker, president of the Ford Foundation, and Miss Agnes Gunn, president emerita of MoMA. Well, Agnes Gunn, president emerita of the Museum of Modern Art, and my dear friend, I believe that diversity and excellence go hand in hand. I think we live in a pluralistic society today and we are all challenged to break out of our normative patterns. Museums are public institutions 
and need to reflect the public. But for the most part, the museum sector is not very diverse. And I think this is something that needs greater attention. You bring up a point that really does um, work into the uh, fabric of museum boards. It, it is being defined by money, Darren. I'm very sympathetic to the circumstance for most museum boards. Public support is being reduced. Mm -hmm. The support from institutional philanthropy um, has been flat, and earned revenue is for the most part flat. And yet expenses are going up. Therefore, you need to raise more money, and it becomes even more important to recruit people who have significant capacity to your board. Yes. So in some ways, we're putting boards in a difficult situation by saying both you need more diversity and you need to raise more money. I agree with you, but it gets back to your governance. If everybody thinks, well, if we get somebody that isn't a collector or isn't able to finance us, we're, we're losing. I think you also have to look at it that you gain by having a diverse and rich environment. So, Aggie, diversity in the corporate sector has been more successful in part because incentives and accountability metrics have been put in place. And so many corporate boards set an objective of diversity across an institution. Uh, we don't do that in the museum world. And I think we may want to consider this because it is very difficult to change normative patterns of behavior without some a strong um, incentive structure around that. Because it's not just about boards, it's about staff and both administrative and operations, but importantly curatorial. Yes. And this is an area where most museums are laggards. So Aggie, how do we begin to solve this problem? I think you can do it through organizations like of uh, the CCL, which is uh, a curatorial leadership group that Buffy Easton runs. And they have done a wonderful thing with their curators, that they have to have a mentoring phase. So they have to choose somebody to mentor people of different backgrounds. But the thing that it did that was so exciting was it brought um, people into uh, be in jobs that they hadn't thought of before, that they didn't know could exist for them. That's, that's right. Often for many yeah. people of color or many people like me from low-income backgrounds, we have no concept of what it means to be a museum professional. So in order to be more diverse and to be more inclusive, we have to adapt some new practices and patterns and approaches within our institutions. And on the issue of diversity, it's important to say that it cuts both ways. I have been involved in organizations and boards that are primarily African American. And when the issue of diversity comes up, people sometimes say, oh, do we want to change? I, I agree. And I think it's often a fear of what you don't know. So I think you have to work on always accommodating people to a situation and not having them have a fear of it. And I think when it comes both from the bottom up within museums and from the top down within um, companies and organizations like Ford, it really helps because you have to have people working from both ends of the spectrum. Well, Agnes Gund, it has been a great joy to talk to you about something we're both passionate about and love, America's museums, and how we can make them even more successful, vibrant, and relevant for a great future. So thank you, dear Aggie, for being with me today. Thank you, Darren. I have entitled this evening's talk, Toward a New Day in Art Museums. That new day will be the result of a process of transformation. And what a new day it will be when our art museums become places that are even more effective sites for educating our visitors.
about the beauty and the power of human creativity, more effective because they are more diverse. It will be a jump for joy day when diversity, e e equity, and inclusion will characterize our art museum's boards, staffs, exhibitions, educational programs, and visitors. Just imagine that new day when our art museums will reflect the extraordinary, the exciting diversity in our nation and in our world. There's a Chinese saying that gives a hint at what that new day will look like. The saying is this, one flower never makes a spring. Yes, that new day in our museums will be an eternal spring. Now, before we commit to and embark on such a serious and necessary and not an easy process of transformation, we need to know the current state of American art museums in terms of their compositional diversity. The Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, under the direction of Vice President Marriott Westerman, has made an exceptional contribution by indeed sponsoring a survey of the staff of our Association of, Amer Association of Art Museum Directors and the American Alliance of Museums. While the results of this survey are not surprising to those of us who have even one eye open as we work in or regularly visit American art museums, the results are disturbing. I want to share with you highlights from the Mellon survey that consists of data from 77% of the Association of Art Museums, numbering 237. Mellon also surveyed 15% of the American Alliance of Museums, 643 member institutions. And I've also drawn on some data from other sources. I told you it's gonna be disturbing. In near top tier museums, white folks constitute a whopping 84%. Another way of looking at this is to say that today only 20 50% of art museum staff in all positions are people of color. In the 237 museums in the Association of Art Museum Directors, fewer than 5% have people of color in senior management positions. I'm sharing with you that from the 1940s all the way through the 1990s, the percent of minorities working in curatorial, conservation, and education departments has remained unchanged at around 27.5%. And as it is said in the Mellon Report, this lack of a youth bulge from historically underrepresented minorities is crippling to any museum aiming to diversify its staff. Now, while white folk make up the majority of the professional staff in museums, we need to remind ourselves that people of color make up over a third of the American population. Here is something that is truly disturbing. While people of color are a third of the American population, according to the National Endowment for Arts, people of color make up only 9% of museum goers. Let me 
give some data now about those of us who hold up half of the sky, as our Native American sisters would put it, women. According to a study by the Association of Art Museum Directors, women hold less than half of the directorships in our museums. And the women who do, because you might be feeling pretty good, half of the directors are women. Now you're not going to feel so good, because the women who do have directorships are paid significantly less than their male counterparts. Women lag behind men in directorships held at museums with budgets over $15 million. And we women directors earn 71 cents for every dollar earned by male directors. While 53% of visual artists are women, over the past 15 years, only 28% of solo museum exhibitions spotlighted women in eight selected museums. I think you're going to find it interesting that only 27 women are represented in the current edition of H. W. Janssen Survey, History of Art. Well. I guess we have to say it's progress, because that number, 27 women, it's up from zero in the 1980s. And I cannot resist this one. Less than 3% of the artists in the modern section of the Metropolitan Museum of Art are women. But 83% of the nudes are women. Let me turn to some observations about American museums and the LGBTQ communities. <clears throat> Whatever the number of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender individuals there are among museum professionals, and such statistics are not now available. It is clear that American museums have paid grossly insufficient attention to artworks done by and about individuals of these communities. The exhibition at the Smithsonian's Portrait Gallery, Hide, Seek, Difference and Desire in American Portraiture, it was on exhibit in 2011 and 2012, was the first museum exhibition to focus on themes of gender and sexuality in modern American portraiture. As you may recall, there was a major controversy around that exhibition when the Smithsonian, in fact, did remove a 1987 video about the suffering caused by AIDS. And we at the Smithsonian do continue to talk about what we have learned from that controversy. We must also question how inclusive our museums are in terms of exhibitions by and about differently able people. And we must ask ourselves to what extent our museums welcome highly qualified, disabled professional staff. We must ask the extent to which our museums accommodate and welcome people with intellectual and physical disabilities. And finally, in terms of groups who have been on the periphery of our museums, I pose this question. How are our museums doing in terms of igniting the interest of the folks that I respectfully but playfully call the young'uns? 
Now, as you know, millennials are quite different from yesterday's museum goers in how they see the world, how they engage with technology, how they pursue their interests. It's not being overly dramatic to say that unless we make changes in our museums that will speak to the patterns and interests of younger people, when the middle age and the older folks who are now our core visitors go on off to glory, our museum galleries are going to be places with dwindling numbers of visitors. We all know that our museums must become more technologically savvy if we are to court the millennials whose electronic devices have become extensions of their bodies. Not only is reaching out to the millennial generation important for cultivating healthy visitorship, but it is critical for preparing the next generation of donors and trustees. Colleagues, I am convinced that embracing, encouraging, and sustaining a diverse workforce in our, in our museums, all of them, but in particular our art museums, is not only the right thing to do, it is the smart thing to do. It's a basic notion in this great country of ours that there should be an equal opportunity for all qualified people to not only enter the workforce, but to be welcomed there and supported to advance through the rank, ranks of an organization. This is the moral case for diversity. There's also a legal case in the sense that from a legal standpoint, every American museum must honor EEO guidelines. But there is another reason for having and sustaining a diverse workforce. Namely, it is the smart thing to do. It is the business case for diversity. And that is if businesses are to compete effectively and art museums must be run like businesses. If businesses are to compete effectively, they must have within their organization employees of diverse backgrounds who will bring different and innovative ideas to the table. In order to be an effective museum director, Brian and I can testify you got to read a lot of articles. You have to read a lot of books. You have to read a lot of reports. But hear this sage advice from our colleague Arnold Lehman, the recently retired director of the Brooklyn Museum. Arnold says the most important book any museum director should read is the United States Census. Indeed, from the U.S. Census and other sources, we know that our nation is becoming more and more a place where so-called minorities are becoming the majority. Old-fashioned ideas about gender identity and sexuality are giving way to greater acceptance of folk who are gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender. There are growing numbers of people who are being identified as differently abled, who have every right to be a part of the American dream. How well you and I know that the young'uns, as I call the millennials, have some very different ideas and interests about, muse about museums and just about everything else, but we want our museums to be a part of their reality. Marriott Westerman, who is the vice president at the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, has said that the case for greater diversity, equity, and inclusion 
in American art museums is clear and it is urgent. And she says, constructive responses to this will be critical to the continued vitality of art museums as public resources for a democratic society. Now it's that moment when I must honor the Noah Principle. You know about the Noah Principle? Well, I'll tell you. The Noah Principle says there will be no more credit for predicting the rain. It's time to build the arcs. And so, sisters and brothers all, here are some specific actions that can set us on a path toward far greater diversity, equity, and inclusion in our art museums. One, we must create and sustain more educational programs that prepare underrepresented groups for careers in art museums. In response to the urgent need for filling the pipeline that leads to professional careers in museums, here are two programs that are making a difference. The Association of Art Museum Directors, in collaboration with the United Negro College Fund, is placing students from historically black colleges and universities in internship programs in a number of art museums, where these students will work with museum professionals in a range of departments human resources, education, conservation, registrar's office, communications and public relations. And we are now exploring setting up a similar partnership with Hispanic serving institutions. And we hope one day to do no less with tribal colleges. The Mellon Foundation has a curatorial fellowship and a conservation fellowship program. And this museum is the recipient of that fine program. Two, as Darren Walker and Agnes Gunn so eloquently but forcibly said in the video we just saw, art museum boards must cease to look like and operate as if they are exclusive clubs for rich white folks. Diverse boards signal that a museum is truly serious about diversity, equity, and inclusion. You cannot lead where you won't go. A diverse board has the great advantage of benefiting from different ideas, perspectives, and experiences in providing the leadership that is expected from these volunteers. Three, there is substantial evidence that a museum director who is committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion is a necessary but not a sufficient factor in instituting and sustaining a diverse workforce. Without a committed leader, a museum will not be a diverse place. But it does take more than a committed leader. Indeed, it takes expressed commitment and action up and down and across a museum. A fourth point. It is my view that instituting and sustaining a diverse workforce, curatorial and educational programs, and visitorship in an art museum is greatly aided by the full engagement of a chief diversity officer. I appreciate that in some museums, like here at the Toledo Museum of Art, the director serves in that capacity thus signaling that there is commitment to diversity at the very top of the organization. 
But it is my view, Brother Brian, that much more can be done when there is a colleague who is schooled in the theories and practices of diversity and inclusion and whose time can be focused on these issues. A fifth point. Exhibitions and educational programs are, of course, at the very heart of what museums are about. They, too, must reflect the extraordinary diversity in our nation and our world. Marketing studies affirm the obvious fact that African Americans are more likely to attend events that are characterized as black themes and events where black people are well represented among the performers. Studies of Latino attitudes towards museums show similar results. A particular report that came out of the Smithsonian's American History Museum noted that second generation Latinos surveyed had very strong expectations that museums should include diverse staff, bilingual interpretation, Latino perspectives, and some Latino-themed content. The same can be said in terms of individuals in Native American and Asian American Pacific Islander communities. Six, the obvious and irrefutable fact is that museums hiring practices and patterns determine who is in that institution's workforce and who is in the museum's workforce strongly influences what exhibitions and educational programs and what outreach efforts are all about at that museum. Imagine how the compositional diversity of a museum would change if, that was a, if there was a requirement that every pool of candidates for every position had to be a diverse pool and candidates from diverse backgrounds were given honest, serious consideration. Number seven, the importance of diversity training. There is overwhelming evidence that each of us, every single one of us, is capable of expressing unconscious bias. <clears throat> and just because we are museum professionals, we're not immune from harboring racist, sexist, homophobic attitudes. Nor does being well-educated, <clears throat> please excuse me, <clears throat> nor does being well-educated automatically shield one from anti-Semitism or Islamophobia. A strong response to these attitudes can and often does lead to getting rid of discriminatory behavior. And that can be done by training folk, by diversity training, by lifting up how every day each of us can engage in unconscious bias. Eight of the 10 resources. There's much that can be done in making a museum more diverse that does not have a big price tag on it. But it is hard to imagine that all that needs to be done for such a transformation can be done without designated resources. You know, we allocate resources for those things that we think are important. So it is that if we really care about transforming our museums into more diverse places, we've got to be willing to put our resources to that task. 
And number nine, once a museum is successful in recruiting a diverse staff, the question is, what kind of an environment, atmosphere, culture will these diverse colleagues encounter? I can't stress enough the importance of creating a welcoming environment where, as the expression goes, every staff member, every colleague brings his or her whole self to work. Studies show that when diversity is coupled with an inclusive culture, then diversity delivers higher performance, less absenteeism, more customer satisfaction, and greater innovation. Inclusiveness happens when groups of people who are different feel free to embrace their uniqueness, and they are encouraged to feel that they belong in a workplace. Ten and finally. I have stressed the importance of a diverse board and workforce. I've called on us to have our exhibitions, our educational programs tell different stories. The tenth and final action that I propose is that the very people for whom our museums are supposed to exist, our visitors, they too must become more diverse. Unfortunately, as I shared with you, only 9% of museum goers in America are people of color. When the first lady of the United States of America, Michelle Obama, spoke at the opening of the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York, and did so in April of this year. First Lady Michelle Obama praised that museum for its outreach work to children and, under this, and underserved communities. And she challenged other cultural institutions to do the same. Mrs. Obama said this, there are so many kids in this country who look at museums and concert halls and think to themselves, that's not for me. She added that as a young girl growing up on the south side of Chicago, she felt the same way. Clearly, if our museums are to serve people in all communities, we've got to put our heads together with folks of those communities to figure out how to make these special places we call museums more welcoming to all. I hope I have managed somehow tonight to communicate the basic point that if we are to be relevant in this ever-changing world, if we are to stay artistically vibrant and financially viable, then our museums must boldly, indeed bodaciously, commit to rethinking what takes place in our museums to whom our museums belong, and who the colleagues are who have the privilege of telling important stories through the beauty, the complexity, the edginess, and yes, the power of art. This process of transforming our art museums it's not going to be easy. Some might even say it is so difficult they aren't sure it can be done. But I want to leave you with the words of President 
Nelson Mandela, who said it always seems impossible until it is done. My day here at the Toledo Museum of Art has been truly inspiring. I knew before I got here that the director, my colleague, my friend, my brother Brian, he is as committed to this issue of diversity equity and inclusion as the devil is committed to sin. <laughs> I had a chance today to meet with the senior management team of this museum. It was one of the most inspiring meetings I've had because when I asked them not only why they're in museums but why they feel that this museum must take on this journey of greater diversity, equity, and inclusion. They didn't skip a beat before they said, why? I met today with the board of the Toledo Museum of Art. And you could sense in that room, a room of distinguished men and women of this community, they are ready. And so it's with enormous hope and optimism that I leave this place. And I'm sure somewhere along the way, I'm bound to say, Holy Toledo! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think we have our mission declared <coughs> and from the presidency of our association. We've had many distinguished people in this association um, who've led it from this museum too. Otto Whitman was twice president of the association. And different ages cause us to do different things and the census calls us uh, to do what Janetta has advised, counseled and taught us is good and smart work. But it's going to take time and it's going to take a challenge. And it is uncomfortable work to be in places you haven't been. Um, no matter whether you travel, it's always a question of where you're from and how you grew up and what cultural values you gained and what happens to them along the way. So uh, I'm just thrilled with your talk, Janetta, in this very beautiful place um, which was made um, for us uh, here in this great city. Um, so I want to invite you to uh, ask any question you might like of uh, our distinguished guest in this wonderful place. And there are microphones here and here, and I just ask you to walk towards them because we probably won't hear you from the floor. So I see somebody with their hand up here. You might walk over here to the mic. And if people want to do that, might give you a line or two um, if you want to ask some questions. But please do. We know that this is a subject that you know people have thought about not known perhaps sometimes whether they could speak about, not known how to go about tackling an institution like this one. It seems pretty big and pretty awe-inspiring with its steps, but it's had this desire to be available to everybody, but we live in this world that Janetta has described, and we're sharing, we hope, but not enough. And so we have an invitation idea, mentality rather than a dialogue and conversation mentality. So there are many people here who can help us, and I think maybe you could do that uh, with some questions tonight just for a few minutes from Janetta. So the first person is over there, yeah? Go Hi. ahead. Hi, Dr. Cole. I have a question about displaying works of art in a museum. Would you, is it bad to put everything 
in one room and call it African art, or should it be dispersed throughout the collection? I mean, I think you can argue that one both ways, and I'd be interested in your opinion. You're asking a question of someone who is the director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African Art. <laughs> I think African art should be everywhere, and I'm going to tell you why. The art of Africa comes from the continent, the only continent in our world that is the cradle of all of humanity. If you go back far enough, then you know that every single one of us descended from Africa. It's the place of the first tools, the first people, the first art. And so I'm totally comfortable addressing everyone in this grand place by saying, my fellow Africans. <laughs> And the sooner white folk admit they're Africans, the better it's going to be. So, as far as I'm concerned, no museum should be without making that point in some way. But there are different ways that our curators and our educators and our directors decide to do that. I can tell you, walking through this museum today, it was wonderful. I, I kept running into friends. There was Amina Robinson's work. It was extraordinary, extraordinary artist from Columbus, Ohio. And then I barely finished. There was a crest mask from the Cross River section of Nigeria. These were not isolated in the African art section or the African American art section. They were placed as great works of art. Thank you. Uh, I want to, my name is Richard Edwards. Uh, I was a former, <coughs> before I retired, a teacher at the University of Toledo Law School. And uh, we, on our faculty was a person who, and her husband worked for this museum. And my impression was at that time, and I assume things have not radically changed, that persons that go into positions with museums are not paid as much until they become directors as they might in other walks of life. And the result is how do you expect to acquire and attract people to come to museums until you can pay them fairly for their work and for what they can offer? Well, you're not going to get any disagreement from me. <laughs> and I'm going to extend your point to say we've got to start compensating well folk who do meaningful, important, and in some cases, sacred work, sacred work like your daughter, who's a teacher, like our museum professionals, who could get far more money if they would go off to Wall Street. We do need to compensate folk who are doing essential work. And a museum is a place without hope we will lose our souls. Yes, we need to do better at that. I might add that Janetta has noted that we stated the purpose of this institution rather unusually. It shouldn't be, but it is. It's really unusual. The purpose of this institution in our documentation is art education. Pure and simple, art education. And I do think there's a bigger point. It only needs to be made briefly. Why is it that 
those who help us to learn and who teach are not some of the most well-paid people in our society. A museum is a place where people come to be, to be present and to learn and to teach each other. Because we found out this summer, of all the people who came to Playtime, 125,000 or whatever it was, 98% of them came with somebody else. So people come to learn from each other. So I think this is a bigger point. Vote to support your teachers. And that's your museums too. Uh, my name is Warren Woodbury. We are fortunate to have the museum reach out to our children, to Mr. Kennedy, and I'm on first name basis with some of the others, Scott and Mike. And we do our programs where we bring uh, minority children from our program. We're at Jones Elementary, we have a chess club, beat every school in the city. But when we bring the children to the museum, some of them think it's the mausoleum because they're really not comfortable until we get them back to our class. And I explained to them that even Picasso, although he can paint wine bottles and grapes, he didn't make a dime until he was influenced by African art. And he admitted it, that African art is what inspires him. So we show our kids African art. They have the books, a little titillation sometimes because the underdress. But we have been fortunate enough to be involved with the museum for the last two years trying to expose art and the museum to our children. I want to thank Mr. Kennedy who initiated it along with some of the other staff members. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. discriminating. You're standing Sorry, over I didn't here. See, are you what about these folk over here? I thought he was security. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, yeah. Sorry. Hi, Dr. Cole. Pleasure uh, to be here. My name is David. Thank you for coming. Uh, as a recipient of a uh, scholarship in third grade, which was probably about uh, 1973, um, came here for a ceramics class. And uh, since that time, I've only done one African-American piece, but uh, made a miniature for you, and I would like to give you and Dr. Kennedy a copy. Oh, Thank you very much. Thank you, David. They come bearing gifts. Please. You know, Dr. Cole, my name is Alex. You know, I have to just say something, if, if I may. The human spirit that leads first to create is a thing of wonder, but even more filled with wonderment is the human spirit that propels giving. So thank you, David. You might just come closer to that microphone. I don't think it's high enough. OK. Yeah. Great. Thank you. My name is Alex Demas, and I have a couple of questions, and I'm going to make a comment. What is your definition of African art? Because on the African continent, there have been so many great civilizations, Egyptians, Nubians, Moors. So typically, in my mind, a lot of Americans think African art is strictly the tribal portion of the art that comes from the villages. So I'd like to know what your definition is and what type of diversity you have in your art at the Smithsonian. Mm -hmm. Well. At the National Museum of African Art, we present the diverse, the dynamic visual arts of the continent. 
And that means from Algeria to Zimbabwe and down to the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa. We don't make that distinction about the great art above the Sahara and the tribal art below it. That's a very old and, in my view, coded message that we just need to get rid of. But it's not easy. For example, we did a great exhibition of the work of a woman whose name is Lala Asebi. She's Moroccan. She doesn't like the word, but some of us would say she's a feminist. I can't tell you how many folk came into our museum and said, we thought you were the Museum of African Art. Why have you got art from Morocco? <laughs> and we said, duh, the last time we looked, Morocco is on the continent of Africa. These notions. Got, we gotta, we got to work on this. And so while Brian will say that the mission of this museum is to educate, I say the mission of the National Museum of African Art is to help our visitors and ourselves to rethink how we think about Africa. The art, and I'm going to give you a little hint, African art, contemporary African art, which we do juxtapose and perhaps not correctly, with traditional African art, because art is over time. But I'm telling you, both contemporary and traditional African art is hot. In the international art market right now, it's commanding extraordinary amounts of money, which is great for the African artists, the contemporary artists. It's terrible for us. We're trying to buy the work. So it's really exciting to see what's happening. That continent, you know, that we've got to work on getting stereotypes put aside. The fastest growing economies in the world are on the African continent. So if you want to think about, you know, making a good move, go buy yourself some contemporary African art. And we have been doing that. Um, <laughs> we bought a Lala Sadie. Um, you walk around and it's a Mary Sabande, or a Yinka Shonibare, or a Elena, Elena Tsui, or a Ramud Hazume. And on the list goes, it's happening. It takes time. But over even a period of years, especially with the help of our collecting society, the Apollo Society, you know, we've been able to do a lot. And we've nearly twice as many members in that society now. These are people knowing that what you say is true. We need to be more representative. And we need to do that to reflect our own communities. So art from Latin America, art from African-American artists who aren't so well represented. We do have significant art, but the way that we show it. So um, we, we, we're waking up. I mean, you know, we talked about this the other day. President Obama is nearly in his eighth year as president. And we heard the American people vote back then. And they decided to demonstrate an incredible change. You know, not that long, 50 years after the Civil Rights Act. And we will be get better at this. And all of you will help us, I know. Um, we have maybe one more question. We'll end up with you. Thank you. Dr. Cole? So I work in the education department here at the museum, and the kinds of programs that you are uh, encouraging us to develop, it's really top of mind for us. And one thing that we've come to, to really think about is those kinds of programs, they aren't going to come from inside the institution. They're going to have to come out of partnerships, out of our community. 
But as you note, when 80 or 91 percent of the community doesn't find the museum as for them, the challenge then becomes how do we gain the trust of the community and engage them? And I was hoping you might offer a little bit of encouragement or advice for us as we endeavor to, to develop these kinds of educational programs. Well, first, my, my kudos to you for, for being in that department and for caring enough to ask that question. I love your use of the word partnership because it really is the key concept that this museum, in the form of its people, in partnership with folk in various communities, there's very little that you can't do. But you're right, the trust has got to be built. This place has got to look welcoming. You've got to perhaps leave this museum Find your way into communities, sitting in meetings at tables where you've never been before. And while you may assume that you're not going to be welcome, I'm willing to guarantee you, you will be. It is a process. It is not an event. We didn't move from having museums that are, in many ways, white spaces. We didn't move from that to even this conversation overnight. And we're not going to go from this conversation to where we want to go overnight either. But I think you actually use the right and most powerful concept, partnership. And I'll give you a wonderful African proverb. It says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Find yourself some partners, some of whom are right in this space tonight. Well, having made the introduction of Jeanetta Cole before she spoke with such an inspiring, challenging, brilliant talk, which I know she would bring to all our colleague museum directors. I didn't have to be a rocket scientist to point out that she's a truly great leader. I mean, what an extraordinary record. Thank you. Thank you. But tonight, I hope you feel with me, um, I certainly feel it very, very much. I have never heard a museum director make a speech like this one tonight. It's a necessary speech. It's an important speech, but you have to be particular kind of person to be able to deliver it. And so, as I invited you at the beginning to give a warm welcome to Dr. Janetta Cole, I invite you to give a warm thank you. Thank you, Janetta. Thank you all. Safe home, all right? Thank you. <laughs>